Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Emmett Interdisciplinary Program in Environment and Resources. My name is Jim Leap. I'm on the faculty of the Woods Institute for the Environment, part of the new Stanford Door School of Sustainability and uh, co-director of the Center for Ocean Solutions. Today, I have the pleasure to serve as the University Oral Examination Chair for Jose Ortiaga's di dissertation defense, examining factors that affect community participation in sea turtle governance. Lessons learned from Eastern Pacific Hawksbill conservation in El Salvador and Nicaragua. After the successful completion of this oral examination, we hope to formally award Jose a doctoral degree in environment and resources. As we open this session, we recognize that Stanford sits on the ancestral lands of the Muekma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with our values of community and inclusion, we have responsibility to acknowledge, honor, and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. Before we get started, I want to introduce the oral examination committee. As part of this committee, I'm joined by his by Jose's lead advisors, uh, Nicole Ardouin, who is the faculty director of the EIPER program, is an associate professor in the Stanford Door School of Sustainability, and a senior fellow at the Woods Institute for the Environment. Larry Crowder, who is the Edward Ricketts Provostial Professor, Professor of Oceans in the Stanford Door School, Senior Fellow in the Woods Institute for the Environment and Professor by Courtesy in Biology. We're also joined by two other members of the Dissertation Reading Committee, Rodolfo Dirzo, Associate Dean of the Stanford Door School of Sustainability, Bing Professor in Environmental Science, Departments of Biology and Earth System Science, and a Senior Fellow in the Woods Institute for the Environment. And William Durham, being Professor in Human Biology and Department of Anthropology Emeritus. After Jose has finished his presentation, members of the audience will get a chance to ask questions and I will moderate that process. I'll repeat this later, but, but as a heads up, you may ask your questions by typing them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and you can do that during the presentation. Once the presentation is completed, I will choose questions from the Q&A box and read them out loud to the audience. For Jose to answer. And with those preliminaries, let me now pass it over to Nicole Ardouin to introduce Jose. Great. Thank you so much, Jim. And uh, it is it is truly my honor and pleasure to be here today introducing Jose for his dissertation events. I am Nicole Ardouin, I'm the faculty director of EIPER and a faculty member in the new social sciences division of the Door School. But most importantly for today, I have had the tremendous pleasure and honor of being one of Jose's lead advisors along with Larry Crowder over Jose's journey. It is my pleasure today to introduce Jose for his dissertation defense. Jose's passion for conservation and dedication to untangling complicated questions related to social ecological systems is simply astounding. His excitement about his work in sea turtle conservation and with communities is infectious. For more than two decades, Jose has been deeply dedicated to marine conservation, working first in community and international development with governments and nonprofits in Argentina and Nicaragua. Jose gained a reputation for being one of the world's great experts in sea turtle conservation. And, and I've had the pleasure of having many people tell me that at conferences and meetings. He then found himself curious about the social science side of the equation which motivated his return to school and brought him to us here at EIPER where we've been so lucky. It's a path for which Larry and I and the others of his advisors have been so grateful. During his time at Stanford, Jose has been a voracious learner and an exceptional colleague. He's taken on numerous opportunities in our various labs to pursue research on projects with the Crowder Lab, Bill Durham's lab, Rodolfo Dierzo's lab, and my own social ecology lab where he's been an incredibly valuable member to all of us. He always brings a keen eye for community engagement, and he's an exceptionally talented partner working with many community partners and collaborators, as you'll hear today. He already has more than a dozen academic publications under his belt, and he's presented at numerous academic conferences. He's won awards for his work, including a fellowship for graduate studies from EIPER, and he was part of the Graduate Public Service Fellowship Program at the Haas Center for Public Service. Jose has also been an exceptional educator and teacher during his time in EIPER. He's taught and co-taught numerous courses, including the Social Oceans course, and especially near and dear to my heart, along with myself and Bill Durham, he was one of our TAs on our sophomore college course in the Galapagos. 
I still remember the first time that I met Jose during the EIPER interviews. And from that very first moment, I could tell that he had a special spark and that he would bring, bring tremendous richness to our program. Thanks to his great experience in the field, I, I too came from a conservation background, actually working with Jim in the field at, at WWF. And so I knew that Jose's background in conservation would really bring uh, something special to EIPER, and he truly has. That experience also sets him up well for his new job, which he'll be starting soon as the Director of Marine Conservation Partnerships with Wild Earth Allies. I have always been so inspired by Jose's interest and his work and his passion for that work, and I'm certain that you will be as well. So I am thrilled that we'll be hearing from him about his dissertation today, and now I'll turn it over to Jose. Jose, over to you. Thank you, Nicole, for that kind uh, introduction. I'm going to pass and share my screen. So good morning and afternoon, everyone. Today, I have the pleasure to present my work dissertation, which focus on the factors that affect community participation in situ governance. As recent graduate marine biologist in 2002, I, I got the opportunity to begin my conservation work in situ conservation with the NGO Fund and Flora International. And when you work in situ conservation in a place like Nicaragua, you quickly realize that conservation is not only about the turtles, but about the people, with all the nuances and variability of people and turtles and their interconnections. For this, we need science that is able to improve our knowledge about the social ecological system. And the work I'm about to present humbly contributes in this direction. Sea turtles, in many ways, are a good illustration of the biodiversity loss crisis that the ocean are facing. For example, the Eastern Pacific leatherback plummeted dramatically at the end of the 20th century, as you can see in this figure. While Eastern Pacific leatherbacks are perhaps one of the most dramatic cases, other sea turtle populations face similar situation. Sea turtles are vulnerable to most of the environmental impacts of, of human activity, from fisheries bycatch to plastic pollution, and from coastal degradation to climate change. And in most places in Central America, one of the most important causes of sea turtle decline has been the overextraction of turtle legs. For example, in Nicaragua and El Salvador, sea turtle legs are highly demanded as a special food. They are used as a side dish in social gatherings, and some folks believe it has aphrodisiac properties. In response to this demand, people from coastal communities have been collecting the eggs as an income source. And for decades, without effective management in place, almost all eggs were being harvested. Thus, to recover this sea population, it became clear that measures to protect the nesting was imperative. But it was also evident the necessity of working with people involving the use of the turtles. And as you probably noticed in the previous picture, there are multiple and diverse actors involved in this issue. For example, on the side of the demand, people like the Nicaraguan congressmen, which motivations are not probably economic. But in the other side, we have the coastal communities where the egg collectors live, in most of the cases in conditions below the national poverty line. The livelihoods rely, at least in part, on the egg collection of eggs. Early in my work as a marine bike conservationist, I had a memorable conversation with Doña Hilda. Doña Hilda was an egg collector and trader a single mother with seven children and already three grandchildren. I asked her what turtles mean to her and she put it on these words. They helped me feel my children when they were hungry and heal them when they got sick. The integration of human development and conservation in places like El Salvador and Nicaragua is at the least an ethical obligation. Moreover, this approach can leverage effective conservation outcomes. These are not my conclusions, there is an extensive body of scholarship that tackle this issue, which I review in the introduction of my dissertation manuscript. But with this intro, I am to provide context and also illustrate the motivations behind my research. So what have conservation projects been doing? And since the mid 2000s in El Salvador and Nicaragua, conservation projects increasingly adopt the use of performance payments for conservation to engage a collectors in the protection of citrus nests. The logic of this approach goes like this. Initially, as I just described, people were collecting the eggs for income, but overharvesting was contributed to the decline of sea turtles. The first reaction by government was top down based on the establishment of regulations and bans. However, 
the extraction of actinius, but now as an illegal market. While people continue collecting eggs, the shifts in policy implied an important transformation on their position as stakeholders. They became poachers, which often caused marginalization and conflict, sometimes violent. In this scenario, the payment for conservation programs emerged. Projects pay to egg collectors to bring the eggs to citoral hatcheries, which allows to produce hatchlings, but also gives back a collector the role as legitimate stakeholders. This reduces conflict and facilitates cooperation in the system, at least in theory. Payment programs have been effective protecting turtle nests. However, stakeholders have valid concerns regarding how these projects are contributing to achieving long-term sustainability. This is an underlying question connecting the three chapters of my dissertation. I acknowledge that the term sustainability in this context, and actually in any, is complex. And I adopt the idea of sustainability from the perspective of the community, that local communities should increasingly develop conditions and capacity to govern sea turtles and decreasingly depend on external assistance. Therefore, as a socio-ecological framework to guide my research, I adopt the sustainable livelihood approach framework. This framework considers that folks, households, or communities usually adopt a set of livelihood activities, a portfolio of practices such as fishing, agriculture, or citrus -like collection, with the objective to achieve livelihood outcomes. The rectangle in the right. For example, more income or more sustainable use of natural resources. Central to this framework is the pool of assets that households own, the Pentagon in the center, or have access to. Through livelihood assets and activities, folk transform, create, and destroy these assets. Assets are usually divided in five, human, social, financial, physical, and natural. And turtle legs or the nesting beach are part of the natural assets. The institutional landscape, including formal and informal institutions, mediates the processes within the livelihood. And finally, in the left, the framework considers the vulnerability context, comprised by things that are totally beyond the control of communities and the system. For example, a pandemic or changes in weather patterns that have an extreme impact on the livelihoods of people. Then, as I mentioned before, my dissertation is comprised of these three research chapters connected through the sustainable livelihood approach framework. In the first chapter, I investigate access to the nesting beach and eggs and how different actors and processes, including incentive programs, mediate on how we're collecting communities exercise access. In the second chapter, I analyze how the socioeconomic condition of a collection households in terms of the livelihood assets is linked to the adoption of a collection as a livelihood strategy and how this contribute to achieving livelihood outcomes. And finally, in the third chapter, I look at the effect of the use of payments on the motivation of a collector to support conservation, particularly inquiring on non-material motivations, which are key to foster collective action. My, my research follows a multiple case study approach and took place in three of the most important nested sites for the Eastern Pacific Hawksville turtle, Bahia de Jiquilisco in El Salvador, and Estero Padre Ramos and Acerradores in Nicaragua. I selected these three sites following a combination of factors. First, conservation projects began since 2007, and this recent history facilitated tracing the evolution of the projects. Second, many conservations regarded these projects as successful examples in terms of the nest protection and engagement of local communities. And finally, in the three sites, the conservation projects use similar approaches to protect nesting, including performance payment for conservation, which facilitates a comparative analysis on the diverse context. Hawkbill turtles are considered critical in danger in the, in, the, in the Eastern Pacific, and these three sites are considered the most important nesting ground for Hawksville, hosting nearly 80% of the annual nesting in the entire region. Interestingly, the sites are estuary mangrove system, and the Hawksville use the interior beaches to nest, which is a, a rare behavior among other sea turtle populations. Here I use the Bahia de Jiquilisco to illustrate the spatial setting. The main nesting areas are highlighted in yellow and the less dense nesting areas in red. And scattered across the area, there are few small rural villages that range in size from less than 10 houses to a couple of hundred. 
I focus my research in 13 communities on the three sites with nearly 5,000 residents. People there live from diverse activities and mostly fisheries, agriculture, and harvesting of other natural resources, including citrus eggs. So as I mentioned, I focus my research on three aspects of the social ecological system and the first look at the issue of access and rights. So as background, most research, address, most research addressing citrus nest in conservation in El Salvador and Nicaragua have described that citrus are managed as an open access resource. This means that any person with capacity to reach the nesting beach can collect eggs freely. Researchers argue that this situation can, has contributed to the overharvesting of eggs. The infamous tragedy of the commons has been referred as the tragedy of open access. In theory, under open access regimes, users lack the incentive to invest in protection and management because they are not sure they will be able to collect the benefits of such benefit or such investments. And a potential way to address this situation is through a strong governmental intervention. But as I discussed before, this do not seem to be a viable solution. An altern alternative solution is the facilitation of community-based or co-management models. Common pool resource theory explains that in order to advance in this direction, among various conditions, the system should count with well-defined social boundaries. In other words, there should be institutional arrangements and rules about who can access and the right benefits of the turtle legs. For example, in Ocional, Costa Rica, a, cooper a cooperative is entitled to this right. If local users gain management rights, this can lead to greater legitimacy of rules and greater compliance. Gaining exclusion rights assure the users that they will capture the benefits of the management actions they undertake. Having this background in mind, for this chapter, I ask the following research questions. Why are citrus eggs managed as an open access resource in the suicides? And have conservation projects changed the access regime, regime? And if so, how? The study is divided in two parts. One look at the history of the governance of Hawksville in the study sites and access regime changes across the recent decades before and after the onset of the conservation projects. And in the second part, I explore the perception of of the stakeholders, particularly a collectors, about the access regime and potential changes. To collect data, I conducted 68 in-depth semi-structured interviews, and with consent of the informants, I audio recorded the interviews and later transcribed them for analysis. In average, interview took between 40 and 60 minutes, ranging from 20 and 20 minutes and five hours. I also undertook participant observation during the field visits, including meetings between egg collectors and conservation staff, visiting the hatchery during operations, and walking with egg collectors while they were searching for nesting turtles. And also I reviewed published and non-published reports, for example, management plans. Interview transcript, field notes, and documentation were analyzed using thematic coding and an inductive approach. Theoretically, the coding was guided initially by the social ecological system frameworks, variables, and then adding emergent themes. Given the time constraints, I'm going to present only part of the results, and here are some that I think provide a richer context for the rest of the presentation. First, it is crucial to acknowledge that the social ecological realities of the three sites were shaped by broader historic processes, which are very similar in Nicaragua and El Salvador. And as a result of this history, it is only after the 1950s that some of these communities started to settle, originally by landless peasants displaced by economic crises, civil war, and natural disaster. This is an important factor to consider because much of the mentality, costume, beliefs of today's communities are shaped by those roots. And the relatively short history, plus the baggage of oppression and agrarian roots explain the lack of community-based institution for the management of mar marine resources, and also has influenced the, the current access regimes. So those observations at the interviews identified two scenarios of access to turtle legs, providing more nuance to the simpler labeling of open access regime. The first scenario described the access situation in Bahia, Jiquilisco, and Padre Ramos. 
Uh, one important step for this research is identifying who are the situ roulette collectors. And when you visit these places, read the records of people participating in the payment programs, you realize that it's there is a relatively easy to identify a group of frequent users who generally are from one or two villages that are closer to the nesting sites. So the open access system in these places may not be as crazy as I described it earlier. In this slide, I illustrate this with a dash circle. Inside there is a group of frequent users and outside a group of people that enter or exit less frequently. They might be neighbors or the frequent users or people coming from remote communities occasionally. The system can be labeled as an open access insofar there are no rules or limitations to who can access. But in fact, it behaves as a semi-open access system. The second scenario describes the situation I observe in Acerradores. And in the mid 2000s, in this area, a private marina enterprise acquired multiple coastal properties concentrated state of 600 hectares. The development caused land tenure dispute with some community groups, and this conflict were still active when I began my research project. In this context, the marina owners invested resource and energy to restrict access to their property, which by the way, was surrounding the main nesting beach. While the coast in Nicaragua and El Salvador by law are under the public domain, this derived in a de facto privatization of the nesting beach. Only people authorized by the marina, for example, employees could access the nesting site and the marina managers pass internal instructions prohibiting the extraction of turtle eggs and other fauna. However, they did not invest resources on monitoring or internal enforcement. So Hawksville eggs continue to be collected, but this time by a small group of local marina staff. So these were the two scenarios that the conservation projects found when they began. One important observation is that despite the heterogeneity of access regime and context, the incentive program have been successful protecting large proportion of facts. As you can see in this histogram showing the percentage of nest protectors per, per season since the Bahia de Jiclisco project began. This figure only shows the data for Bahia de Jiclisco, but the trends was very similar in the other two sites. In the interviews, informant explained the increase in protection from the first season to the last as a reflection of the project staff and egg collectors learning, trust and capacity building, and the diffusion of information about how the project works across the communities. Another key finding of this chapter is that the three study sites, a collector strongly oppose any access restriction measure, even if the restriction will benefit them. For example, this egg collector in Padre Ramos responded energetically. I think it's wrong to prevent others to come. The beach belongs to everyone. Another collector this time in Bahia de Jiclisco expressed in this way, the Lord has left nature so that we can all make use of it, but in compliance with some forms. These two fragments illustrate a widespread support of, common of open access, or better say, the way they are handling access of turtles. And as you can notice, by the use of words such as wrong or the evocation of religion, a collector's position seems to be rooted in moral grounds. The second quote also show a widespread perception that even on their open access, they hold a set of norms that expects others to comply with. For example, not harming the nesting turtles and respecting other egg collectors. The last aspect of this chapter I would like to highlight is related to the issue of enforcement. In the three sites, sub informant recognized that to implement a new access regime, government enforcement was required. For example, this community leader entertained the idea of implementing some community-based model, but immediately it reflected, who is going to keep outsiders from coming to the beach? Several informants allude to the inconsistency and absence of government support to enforce already existing management laws for example, illegal fishing activities such as blast fishing. Thus, they, they have low expectations about enforcement agencies fulfilling their role in more sophisticated co-management regimes. Lack of enforcement is often cited as one important cause of environmental problems, particularly in settings like this. And initially, we attribute the lack of enforcement as a consequence of lack of resources or corruption. 
However, I also found that the lack of coercive enforcement may be an intentional policy. For example, this experience environmental ministry officer explained in this way. Our policy is to raise awareness and identify alternative not to put them in jail. As I described previously, top-down enforcement historically exacerbated the conservation crisis, marginalizing local communities. Government and environmental agencies were subject to criticism for this approach. The evidence I collected in, in my work suggests that government opt to avoid any type of coercive enforcement. However, this may be an extreme reaction. Common poor resource theory indicate that sustainable governance requires a system of graduate, sans, graduate, gradual sanctions. Thus, a big challenge ahead is to come up democratically with local communities with a tailored rule system and supports its enforcement consistently. So a conclusion of this chapter, we learned that conservation programs using, using incentives are versatile and can work even in conflictive scenarios that the current access regimes are complex and nuanced. And in Padre Ramos and Bahia Gilisco, these are supported by local communities. The conservation organizations aiming to foster more robust governance with access restriction should be cautious and facilitate bottom-up participation. Current de facto privatization of the nesting beach in Acerradores is marginalizing some local communities, people whose livelihood depended in part on the use of this place. This implies a conflict which can escalate to violence with negative social and ecological consequences. And finally, governments should proactively explore ways to address the lack of enforcement perceived by local residents and NGOs in ways that are innovative and that do not return back to the times of top-down enforcement. Additionally, to play a more active role as mediator on those conflicts. So this was the summary of chapter one, and now we can move to chapter two, where I looked on households asset condition and its links to a collection as a livelihood strategy. Frequently rural development and conservation practitioners assume that improving the socioeconomic condition of wildlife users, for example, by providing economic alternatives will help to curb hunting or harvesting of endangered wildlife. The theory, of change of this approach can be described as this, by providing new improved economic alternatives that await the loss of income of wildlife extraction, while hunting or harvesting will be less as attractive and folks will disengage. In situ conservation, this logic of change implies that the socioeconomic condition of coastal people predicting the livelihood, predicts the livelihood of co collecting eggs. In other words, the better the socioeconomic condition of a household, the less likely this household will engage in a collection. As I described earlier, qualitative evidence suggests that economic motivations are central to a collection practice. However, there have been less empirical work addressing this question from a quantitative perspective. Thus, in my second chapter, I explore the motivation of coastal residents to engage or not in a collection, and particularly the association between household socioecological characteristics and a collection. For this study, I collected two types of data. First, in 2016, we conducted a census of households counting 1,280 inhabited dwellings. And from these, 92% responded a short questionnaire inquiring about activities that provided income to the household, including if they had collected eggs during the 12 months prior to the survey. Then we drew a random stratified sample from the citrus egg collecting and non-collecting households. We monitored Hawksville Nesting Beach for three consecutive years, georeferencing the nest location, counting eggs, and observing if the eggs were protected or gone to the legal market. As example, here I show the map of Bahia de Jiquilisco with the location of the dwellings in blue and the Hawksville nest in gray. With this data, I computed a nest abundance index per household and community. This index is proportional to the nest count in the nearby beaches and inversely proportional to the average descent from nest to the households or communities. In this graph, each point represents a community and it shows the association between the nest abundance per community in the horizontal axis 
and the proportion of households that collected hot pill eggs per community in the vertical axis. This result somehow was suspected and confirms an association between resource abundance and engagement in its use. But methodologically speaking, implies that these socioecological variables should be used as a control when evaluating the association of socioeconomic characteristics and egg collection. Thus, to analyze the association of household socioeconomic condition and egg collection, I conducted a multivariate regression analysis using data from the survey. As a proxy of wealth of household, we computed an index of the house construction quality. To build this index, we assigned scores based on the construction materials and other characteristics of the dwelling. As an example, the house on the left has lower score than the one in the, the right. We consider stable wage jobs, symmetric of household income and human capital. We also included agricultural land size owned by the household, fishing boats owned by the household. We also consider the average, average school grade attained by household members. We control for labor capacity for each household calculating the number of members. In addition, because most egg collectors are male, we use this as a control variable. And also we control for the nest abundance index for the household. So using the, the software R, I standardized these variables and fitted them to a logic generalized linear model. For this, I specified two dependent variables, both binary. The first was, was the egg collection status defined at the household reporting that at least one member collected eggs at least one in the 12 month prior to survey. And the second, the dependency on a collection. For a collecting household that consider this activity among their three most important income sources. The results of this analysis are presented as odd radios. This can be interpreted in this way. Using as reference the vertical line, which mark the odd radio equal to one, when the old radio is near one, it indicates that there is no association between the respective independent variable and the dependent variable. If the old radio is higher than one to the right of the vertical line, this indicates a positive association. And if the old radio is below one to the left of the vertical line, that indicates that there is an inverse association. So let's see the results for dependency on a collection. For each variable, I am presenting the results for Padre Ramos, Bahia de Hikilisco, and this pulled together. Using as reference the point estimate, we can see a negative association between house index, weight job index, and the education attained. The results also suggest a positive association between land tenure and vote ownership. When we add the confidence intervals, we see that some of the associations remain statistically significant, while others are not statistically significant. The results for each independent variable deserve its own discussion, which I provide in the dissertation manuscript. However, for the sake of time, let me focus in the education attainment. As you can see, the education attainment show a more consistent, significant association across the site. So what does this mean? Does this mean that we can reduce situational like dependency by improving education attainment in these communities? Well, I will never argue against improving education attainment and offering more education opportunities. However, within this model, a higher level of education attainment among households should be interpreted as an indicator. We are not trying to establish here direct causal relationship. High gather education attainment may be linked to household wealth because households that consistently meet the minimum economic needs can support the children's school's attendance through time. Additionally, a high level of education attainment may increase households access to better pay job opportunities. On the other hand, households with a lower level of education attainment may have experienced difficulty meeting their needs to send their children to school over time or may feel pressure to recruit the children to household production earlier, which may increase the likelihood of a school dropout. So those were the results of egg collecting dependency. Let's move to egg collection. In contrast to egg collection dependency, egg collecting included households that collect eggs but did not consider this as a primary income source. In this case, the model output indicated that egg collecting and non-egg collecting households 
on average, did not differ in the socioeconomic characteristics. So in summary, we found evidence suggesting that within the context of the study sites, dependency in a collection is linked to the lower socioeconomic condition of households, but that collection as occasional or opportunistic practice is independent of the socioeconomic condition of households. Another finding of this chapter that I would like to highlight is related to food security, which as I referred earlier, is an important livelihood outcome. In our survey, we included three questions used in food security studies. The first regarding two instances of food shortage. Depending on the site, between 30% and 50% of the households reported these experiences. We did not find statistically differences between egg collecting and non-egg collecting households. Regarding the frequency of the food deprivation measure as the number of day experiencing food shortages within the worst months of the year, Informant reported an average of six to 10 days per month, depending on the study site. We also inquire about the months of the year where those experiences occur. And you can see that we can identify some periods of the year where food insecurity prevalence, prevalence worsen. And if we compare these results with the citrus nesting season, we can see that these periods overlap substantially. Thus, this present compelling evidence that egg collection provides an incoming in, sorry, provides an income opportunity during some of the harsher months of the year and contribute to household food security. In conclusion, in chapter two, I contribute to understand the links between household assets and livelihood outcomes and citrus like collection. Some take homes are dependency on a collection is linked to the socioeconomic condition of household. However, occasional egg collection is independent. And I demonstrate a strong association between nesting abundance and the use of turtles. And this finding have implications regarding the theory of chain referred at the beginning of this chapter, that through economic improvement, people will disengage of collecting eggs. At least within the range of socioeconomic condition that we observe in this study site, this is that dubious without other, this is dubious if not other transformation occurs in the system. And finally, a collection is an important subsistence activity for local communities, which contribute to food security. This empirical evidence supports the long-term claim of a collectors and conservation projects that have been working in the sites. Depriving people from access to these resources can harm people. Then highlighting both the social value of recovering citrus populations and the ethical imperative of providing alternatives, such as the conservation incentives. So that was the summary of chapter two. And now we can transition to the last chapter that explore the connection between cash incentives and conservation motivations and behavior. Despite the proliferation of performance based payment for conservation, practitioners, policymakers, and scholars have mixed opinions about their effectiveness. And as with other financial mechanisms, this debate has covered a range of perspectives, including environmental justice or economic efficiency. For many skeptics, a key concern is that the use of payment may render the recipient as exclusive rent seekers who will only adopt conservation behaviors upon receiving material rewards. These interpretations are grounded on self-determination theory from the social psychology and crowding theory from the behavioral economics. These theories state that people may be motivated intrinsically to undertake certain behaviors because of the connection of those behaviors with positive affective aspects such as joy or interest. By contrast, people may also be motivated by extrinsic stimuli, such as the desire to avoid punishment or to attain rewards. There is empirical evidence showing that under certain circumstances, the use of extrinsic incentives can erode intrinsic motivations. And the concern emerged then because prosocial and pro-environmental behaviors in part are fostered by non-material motivations. So in my third chapter, I explore this issue by asking the following questions. Are a collectors participating in incentive programs only driven by economic motivations? And if not, what other motivation foster their participation? To further explore this question, I investigated the illegal market of turtle eggs 
And we could do so because in parallel to Hawksville nesting, there were also Oli Ridley nesting and those turtles were not as well protected. And there was an active illegal market. According to a collector, Hawksville eggs had similar price than Oli Ridley. We recruit three experienced egg collectors from Padre Ramos and three from Bahia de Jiquilisco and phone call them weekly to survey them about occurrence of transactions and the price of the eggs on those transactions. With this method, we documented prices of more than 200 illegal transactions. And with this data, we, will time, we build time trends of monthly average of the illegal market price of eggs. And here are the results for Bahia de Jiquilisco. The red line shows the illegal market monthly variation. The dot dashed line shows the conservation incentive price per X. And the dot line on top shows an average price of all incentives, including variable items paid by conservation projects, for example, a hatchery incentive. The main finding here is that in the case of Bahia de Jiquilisco, the incentive payment exceeded the illegal market. Thus, from the market logic, it was expected that the collectors would prefer to sell to the conservation project. And here are the results for Padre Ramos. Here we can appreciate that the illegal market fluctuated with respect to the conservation incentive prices. With some periods where the illegal market prices exceeded the conservation incentive prices. So the follow-up question is how a collector respond when the legal market prices is more profitable, particularly if we hypothesize that the collectors are behaving as exclusive rent seekers. We should expect for them to prefer the legal market when these offer higher prices. To explore this question, I calculated the price difference between the legal market price and the conservation prices with respect to the illegal market price and contrasted them against the Hawkbill nest protection rates. We analyzed the association between these two variables fitting the data to a generalized linear model and controlling for the number of nesting occurring that month. And this plot shows the results. The vertical axis represent the nest protection as radio over the total nesting, and the horizontal axis, the proportional difference of prices. Negative value of this variable indicates months when the legal market prices were higher than the conservation market, okay. and vice versa. Positive value indicate months where the conservation market had offered higher prices. Overall, this plot, this plot clearly shows that the level of protection of nests remained high independently, independently of the difference in prices. And you can imagine the res, the, that the regression analysis did not yield statistic difference uh, associations. People support the conservation even when the legal market offered prices up to 50% higher. So the follow-up question was why? So we asked egg collectors why they support the conservation even when the illegal market offer better prices. And for this, I use a semi-structured interview and inductive analysis described for this research in chapter one. In this way, I learned that egg collectors' motivations are complex and diverse, material and non-material. I do not have time to dive deeper in these results, but would like to show some examples. One is that egg collector value the conservation benefits that come in a bundle with incentive payment. Most egg collectors underscore this aspect. Take as instance this response from an egg collector in Bahia de Jiquilisco. We are aware that the project is protecting the turtles for the future, and we also have to play our part. This response first shows that this egg collector value the conservation project contribution to recover the situation rookery. The expression we need to play our part implicitly alludes to sense of belonging in a collaborative process between conservation projects and community and expresses a sense of responsibility, which is a crucial condition for collective action and conservation for, with, and by the community. This response from an egg collector in Padre Ramos is also very illustrative. We know that the project is not paying well now. We are not happy with this, but we gave a word and we have to honor it. We will have to ask a better deal for the next season. This head collector is aware of the price differences and he is implicitly interpreting this as a lost opportunity. However, he supports conservation 
motivated by the integrity of his word. Here, as a side note, I have to explain that in Padre Ramos, the conservation project had at least one meeting with their collectors to discuss aspects on the implementation of the project ahead of each nesting season. And among several aspects, they discussed the prices and sometimes they bargained until reaching consensus. This is explained in detail in the dissertation manuscript. But what I would like to highlight is that again, this collector response implied that he built part of a collaboration, maybe a little bit more contractual this time. It provides more nuance to the nature of the collaboration in the sense that it is not all a bed of roses. There are tensions, different position and power dynamic among the parts. The thing is that conservation projects create the, ask, the spaces to address differences, a place to ask, but such as the meeting I just described. Egg collectors have opportunities to participate, agree the rules of the game, and solve conflicts. This also connects with an increased sense of autonomy, which is an important condition to foster intrinsic motivations according to self-determination theory. And the last thing I would like to present quickly is related to this candid response of an egg collector in Padre Ramos. There are gossipy people in this community, and I do not want them to talk about me on my back. This reminds us of the role of social norm as a strong motivator for behavior. This statement implies that this collector believes that his neighbors expect from others to support the conservation project, regardless of the difference with the illegal market, suggesting the existence of pro-conservation collective norms. So earlier we asked how a collector respond when the illegal market is more profitable and our results indicate that they prefer the conservation option. The next question is why? And we provide evidence that a collector decisions are made by an array of conflict motivations, some of which may lean toward the intrinsic side of the motivation spectrum. And especially they can be labeled as pro-social and pro-environmental. We cannot attribute the emergence of these motivations to the incentive programs. Many of those, such as respect of the agreements, were already held by a collectors. But we can argue that projects using economic incentives can foster conservation behavior without eroding some of the pro-social and pro-conservation motivation. And this is the conclusion for this chapter. And this was the body of my dissertation work. I investigated the livelihood framework of coastal communities near one of the most important nesting beaches for one of the most endangered population of sea turtles in the world, in the Pacific coast of El Salvador and Nicaragua. I provide novel information that contributes to the common pool resource literature and hopefully will inform future development and conservation work in these places. To finalize, I would like to share three considerations. First, this research demonstrates that conservation incentives work not only by protecting the nests of turtles, but by enabling pathway for collaboration and the integration of local communities in meaningful ways. However, it is crucial to underscore that these conservation projects are complex intervention and that is the combo of approaches along with incentives what makes things work. Second, on the other side, it is important to recognize that there are complex challenges that remain unaddressed, for example, the conflict in Acerradores. And a potential downside of the incentive program is that these with the short-term success, paradoxically, may lead us to neglect these complex challenges. And finally, one last thought. Bahia de Jiquilisco, Estero Padre Ramos and Acerradores are outstanding places. Esmeral mangrove stories where Hawksville sea turtles fulfill almost the entire life cycle. In this work, we have learned that there is another outstanding ingredient to this place. And this ingredient is the people. If there was only one thing to learn from this presentation, I will say that is this. We learned today that living together with these turtles, there is outstanding good people that despite their struggles and difficult history are willing to play their part to sustain these turtles that are part of the livelihoods. Thank you.
first of all, uh, congratulations, Jose, on a fantastic presentation. Um, really ex inspiring work, um, and you captured it really very well. Um, we have a little bit of time uh, for questions. Um, and then the other, and otherwise, I think maybe Nicole has a question to kick us off. I I do I have I have a number of questions I'm happy to start, I'm happy to start with one I'm also happy to save some for later if other people have questions first of all um such a fantastic job Jose I I of course knew that your work uh, I know your work has always been inspiring and I knew you would do a terrific job today and it was just marvelous um so I I have a maybe I'll start with one that was at, at the end and something we've talked about a lot but I, I you know I'm more, I'm always really interested in when you talk about the norms in the work. And just now you were talking about how people were really um, motivated in some ways, inspired by this notion of kind of injunctive norms, what they thought others expected them to do. And uh, since you're going to work for a conservation organization, I wonder if you could talk about how you might think about building that into some of the work of conservation organizations. How might you think about working in communities, um, knowing that what people think others are expecting of them to do is an important ingredient in the kind of work we might do in conservation organizations? Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Yeah, I think uh, I think like the one important part is is that is 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 acknowledge for from us as conservation uh, organizations that local communities already have a baggage of injunctive norms and beliefs, and some of them are pro social or pro environmental. Um, sometimes uh, they just need a a lead a little help because there is a like a strong barrier or limitation that uh, uh, prevent this motivation to be activated to see to to do in those ways and and obviously these conservation programs uh, as i say they are complex intervention we need to think in in many approaches environmental education uh, is 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 very important and participate uh, for example on these projects already are implementing um, uh, initiative like the Hawksville Cup, which uh, mimics uh, mimics a World Cup or a soccer World Cup between communities. Um, <laughs> they do this public awareness campaign where the goals are, uh, are scored by conservation goals, and really, really put put the motivations of people into you know strengthen, like incentivize more people to do what they are already doing and create this 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 sense of of community. And if you notice, uh, this approach is not random. People really like soccer in this place. People like sports, right? Uh, people live in the Toronto. So the combination of those two things is effective. And we need to, to, to use that, right? To use that knowledge of theory in one side, that knowledge of the place in the other side, to try to tailorize the interventions. Yeah, uh, uh, Jim, can I jump in? Yeah, sure, Larry. Um, Jose, uh, awesome talk. It's uh, really great to see all this come together. Um, I'm interested in uh, the, role, the role of NGOs. I know from my long history in the turtle community, this payment for conservation thing was extremely controversial. Uh, people thought it was a terrible idea. Other people thought it was a good idea. I'm interested in your view of the role of NGOs, in, including multinational NGOs uh, versus homegrown NGOs like local NGOs in uh, in Nicaragua or El Salvador, help people react to those interventions based on the perception of the NGO, whether it's local or or uh, international or at least not local. Well, thank you, Larry. Uh, yeah. Um... Well, I think I, I, you know, we know the history of of conservation practice from the north to the south, and how this has been evolving, right, from a very top down uh, approach uh, to a more like cooperation approach. And there's still a lot of work to do. But I will say that when I I, I started working in this, I, I had the opportunity to be recruited by a by a conservation NGO. And um, this, this principle of trying to, uh, you know, collaborate with the communities, to understand the communities, to try to design the programs that fit the context, what's, what's ready, was really incorporated in the, in the mindset. What I would say, and, and I would say that you talk with almost any conservation practitioner in this moment, and, and they will pretty much replicate this, this mindset. 
And, and I think like the, the issue right now is how, right? And I think we are in that stage because one is wanting, one thing is wanting and the other is doing, right? Because at the end, uh, there are always going to be limitations in the connections uh, between what is coming, wh who are coming from outside and the people that is living in their own realities. And also even things uh, as priorities or timing right and i would say like one of my biggest 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 re uh, recriminations to the conservation especially the big conservation uh and in and in yeah the conservation organization and also developing agency conservation is this mentality that everything needs to be super efficient and achieved like in very short 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 terms which uh you know cal uh, is causing in many is is pushing many interventions that in, in, in intentions are good to fail just because they are being rushed. Okay, so I don't have any questions in the Q&A box and I realize we're almost at the top of the hour. So uh, Jose, if you wanna go ahead and, and move on to your acknowledgements and we will close and go into the closed session. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want to break down here and melt down in front of everybody, but uh, I, I I need to acknowledge so many people. I, I I I truly feel privileged by all the amazing people I have crossed pathway in my PhD journey. And I I never going to find the right words to express my gratitude adequately. First. I need to, to thank uh, the beautiful people from Bahia Hiclisco and Padre Ramos and Serradores. This research could not be possible without them. And it's about them and for them. Uh, uh, each time I close my eyes, I think in these places, um, this, the first thing I see is a huge smile at the door. And I will be always appreciative of, of that. Um, I want to quickly uh, mention to all the research collaboration, uh, my research collaborators in different organizations like Procosta, Fauna Flor International, uh, that uh, Anicapo, that has been integral to the elaboration of this process. We are part of the same of the same crew. We share ideas and like try to uh, work together to to progress in the direction that all want that is like more development, uh, sustainable development in these in this beautiful places. Uh, and also a bunch of young uh, people from communities and also universities in, in Nicaragua and El Salvador that uh, assisted in the implementation of this project. Uh, this, this research will have not be possible without, without their support. And, and also I need to acknowledge the enabling institutions uh, like the environmental agencies and organizations that that uh, open doors and uh, introduce me people and allow me to get access to many places that without them will, be, will have been possible. And also I wanted to mention quickly all the communities partners to whom I had the extraordinary opportunity to work during my dissertation work here. Um, uh, that gave me the space and the opportunity to focus on very important uh, projects that may not have been directly uh, uh, connected to my dissertation, but was very important uh, and integral to my formation, uh, my academic formation, my PhD formation. And also want to acknowledge uh, all those that uh, uh, provide the resources uh, for the, the, the many of the beautiful pictures you you saw in this presentation can be credited to Alison Shelley and Wilder's allies. And also I, I use a lot of uh, icons of the noun project. In a Stanford, I, I will never end up acknowledging all the spaces and the people that uh, provide me provide me multiple opportunities to grow what I was uh, transiting, my long transiting through, through, through this stage. Uh, but I have to acknowledge particularly to uh, the EIPER staff 
Um, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't have words to, uh, to demonstrate the appreciation I have for the care, the mentorship, the patience that I received from, from the EIP staff. Uh, but if particularly I have to, to highlight one thing that I all, always going to remember is uh, the capacity to create this amazing and unique community. Uh, we will feel like a family and where we can go whenever we have a problem or we need contention or, or, or we need support. Uh, also, uh, EI per students, including my PhD cohort, which uh, some of them have long left me, but but I stay in contact with them. And and uh, and folks, I I didn't let you down, but later than never. But seriously, thanks for inspiring me and being there every time I ask for help. And also to other partner students from EI per that I do not mention because I do not want to omit anybody. There is always a natural trend as a PhD student to interact with people that is closer in time to your core, previous and after. And when you start the PhD program and you met the older court, you feel a little bit intimidated and mesmerized because all these are small, smart driven people in some mean, meaningful directions. Um, and then uh, it's your turn to to receive the incoming call, the incoming cards. Uh, but the experience is the same. You feel mesmerized, intimidated, and and amazed by how inspiring and how smart all of you are. And you know, I feel privileged to to have been part of this this group. And a similar feeling is for for. For the labs, the groups, uh, I have belonged uh, and I have been active, particularly the Crowder Lab, the Social Ecological Lab, and the College of Society. The sentiment is exactly the same. And I value all the opportunities I have to collaborate in research, to have a stimulating academic, and, uh, and, but also uh, social uh, interactions. And, and then it's my advising committee. Uh, folks, I, I really don't want to go deep here because I am going to uh, melt down, but uh, I think uh, that uh, I will have a particular words appreciation with you, but uh, what I'm trying to think what to say that I didn't come at, uh, I had the opportunity to reflect on how privileged I am for having such an extraordinary group of mentors. I thank you for the intellectual nurturing, for being always so approachable and patient. I'm taking with me some of your contagious patients about so many environmental issues and the way to address them intellectually. I really hope that while I return to the field to work in conservation, we can we can find ways to continue collaborating. And Jim, uh, really thank you for 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 being uh, for supporting this this. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, for supporting this this uh, this work. Uh, the, the, sorry for facilitating the defense uh, and taking the time to to learn about uh, turtles in Nicaragua and El Salvador. And, and obviously the funders, which uh, without them, nothing of these uh, will have been possible. Um, and finally, a couple of words uh, to acknowledge my family, to Monica, my wife and partners for being always there unconditionally, for loving me unconditionally. And to my daughters, Camila and Lara for being the spark, the fuel that inspired me to keep going even during those periods of hesitation. This journey is something that we all endure and enjoy together. And I thank you for that. And also 
also I want to take uh, one second to thank my late mother, Paula, uh, who I am dedicating this dissertation for believing me irrationally. I want to remember her today as a young widow mother with her son in her backpack, who in search of utopia took me to Nicaragua. My love for nature and these people is in the same place where I treasure him, her memory. Thank you. And thanks everyone again for being part of this important moment.